Great. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, you know it's great to be taking part in this. Um, so today I'm I'm going to talk about the idea of inferring what to do, and by that I'm essentially talking about the idea of planning as inference from the perspective of active inference. And to just unpack that a little bit, the key idea is that we can think of different ways of behaving as being different hypotheses for what sort of behaviour I could I could pursue. And when you put it in those terms, the question of how do I select a behaviour becomes one of inference of hypothesis testing. And one of the key things there from a Bayesian perspective is that when, when we have to adjudicate between alternative models of how we're going to act, we need to have a space of priors. We have, need to have priors over that space of how to act, things that tell me a priori, am I more likely to do this or that? And the focus of this talk is going to be on the sorts of priors we use in active inference to decide on how to act. Um, and the sorts of behaviour that emerge from, from those choices of priors. Uh, the overall structure of the talk is shown here. So I'm going to start just by unpacking some of the basic principles underneath active inference and provide a little bit of an introduction to that. Then there's the notion of a generative model, which is central to active inference in that, or, or any form of inference, where you, you, you have a forward model that would predict some data, and the inference process is about undoing everything that's been done to generate those data to work out what caused them. And then I'm going to look at several different sorts of behaviour, including exploitative, exploitative and explorative behaviour, uh, and the relationship between the two. Um, before finally touching upon the, the idea of um, the implementation of decisions in terms of movements and sort of hierarchical structure of uh, control of those sorts of processes in um, developing behaviour. So starting with active inference, uh, the key idea is set out in this slide, which just shows two different sorts of system. So on the left, you can see a system that um, it does not hold its form over time. It's something that is gradually diffusing outwards there's random fluctuations that are just dispersing, uh, dispersing this system. On the right, on the other hand, although there are random fluctuations and dispersive effects, those have been countered such that the system maintains a consistent form over time. And this slide is basically to say that the scope of active inference deals with systems like those on the right and does not deal with those on the left. Putting that in terms of the density dynamics of those probability distributions, here we're now looking at. Um, uh, here, here we're looking at what would happen if we had effectively an infinite number of, of these particles that we're averaging over. And we're seeing on the left again, it just becomes uniform over time. Whereas on the right, it reaches a steady state. It reaches this probability distribution and effectively stays in that distribution uh, for the rest of time. And is, is is consistent. So, what sort of dynamics do we need to make sure that this works? or that we can maintain that sort of steady state. Um, we can think of that by actually plotting the probability distribution um, at that steady state and the dynamics that a particle would have to have or any sort of system would have to have to maintain that. So here on the left, we've got the probability distribution on the right plotted as a surface plot. And we're just showing with the red dot one instance of that sort of system. And the key thing to take away from this is that any time it's um, moved from regions of high probability to lower probability, it moves back up the probability gradient. So you've got a system that on average is behaving such that it occupies regions of high probability rather than low probability. Now, why is this a useful perspective? Um, the reason is that we can now interpret this probability distribution as if we were uh, thinking from the perspective of Bayesian statistics. So we can now think of this probability uh, as being a probability of some data that we've gathered, y, uh, and we can take the log probability of this and, and treat that as the log uh, evidence of some model. So model evidence is basically a measure of how good a model is, it's a marginal likelihood that says, under this model, how likely would it be that the data I've seen were, could have been generated by this model? And to make that more explicit, we can express it in terms of a model as a joint probability distribution. So here we've got the probability of x and y. So x here is, is going to be our um, hidden states of the world, our explanatory variables, our hypotheses for what's causing y. Uh, and we can think of this joint probability distribution as being a model of processes that are generating y from x. And here, 
uh, we've basically used the, the product rule of probability, but in logarithmic form. So we've, we've basically got the relationship between the model evidence or the log model evidence is the log join probability minus this posterior probability or the probability of our explanations given the data that we've measured. And we can express that graphically uh, in terms of a, a factor graph. And the idea here is that our sensory data Y are caused by our hidden states or hidden, hidden causes X. Um, and that the process of going from X to Y, it, it depends upon a likelihood of distribution. So the probability of some data given, given some states. And we can also put a prior on top of those hidden states that says, before we've observed anything, how do we expect those um, unobservable variables to be distributed? And so our probability of Y, that thing we were trying to maximize or the, uh, our particle was trying to reach the high probability levels in the previous slide, um, is, the, is a measure of the goodness of this sort of model, of how, uh, how well it predicts those um, data. Now, it's not always easy to compute this quantity directly. And the reason for that is that this final posterior probability term, um, of, to, to compute that, you often need to compute um, computationally or, in, or analytically intractable integrals or sums. Um, and that's because we need to be able to compute this term as well. So either if, either the model evidence itself or this posterior probability can be quite difficult to, to actually practically calculate. But fortunately, we can calculate a related quantity known as free energy. Uh, and you can see that this quantity looks very much like the expression uh, of the model evidence. So going back to that for a second. And you can see that we've still got this probability joint probability of X and Y, um, our generative model. Um, and then we have our additional probability term here that we've subtracted. Um, but here we've replaced the posterior probability. I'll show you the previous one again. We replaced P of X given Y with this Q of X distribution, which we can choose to be a distribution that's very easy to, um, um, to express and to parameterize. So we can think of this as an approximation to a posterior distribution or a variational distribution. And then the other thing we've done is we've just averaged. So this E expectation symbol means we're averaging under that Q distribution. So the relationship between uh, those two quantities, between the free energy and model evidence, we can get simply by rearranging this. We just factorize this term into, uh, into a model evidence, and uh, which is this one here and a posterior probability. And we can see that when the posterior probability is equal to Q of X, the negative free energy is exactly the same as this P of Y term as model evidence. So by minimizing our free energy, we're maximizing the model evidence, just as our random system in the previous uh, few slides was doing on average. So, with that, we can sort of summarize active inference as the process first of setting Q to be as close as possible to P. So minimizing our free energy so that we uh, minimize this bound. Um, and once that's done, that means that P of Y is, is, um, is very, very close to this term here, that the free energy uh, becomes a very good approximation for the log model evidence or the negative log model evidence. So we can now choose actions shown here as A, that affect our sensory data. So we can actually change the data itself um, uh, through acting upon the world, such that it brings us back to these regions of very high probability. So minimizing our free energy, or again, maximizing our model evidence, uh, or finding the very high probability regions of our steady state density. So what does this actually look like in practice? So in practice, we can interpret this uh, by separating out uh, just as we've done in the diagram on the left, we can separate out our generative model into our likelihood, our probability of y given x, and our prior. And then we can find the value of q of x that minimizes this. And in this simple example, um, <clears throat> where we only have one sort of explanatory variable, that, that turns out to be just our likelihood and our prior. We can think of this as if we are passing messages from our sensory data to our uh, hidden states and from our prior beliefs about the hidden states. And we're combining these two messages from different directions to come up with our posterior probability. 
And we can think of that a bit like uh, what neural systems are doing, where um, we only have to pass messages from local um, synapses to update the firing rates of individual neurons. To relate this more directly to dynamical systems like the brain, we can express this as if it were a gradient descent. So now imagine we're looking at the mode, or we're trying to find the mode of posterior probability. Um, and we can do that by essentially doing this gradient descent on the free energy. Um, uh, and we can split that out into the gradients of the likelihood and the gradients of the prior evaluated at that mode. Um, under certain different assumptions, we get to different sorts of message passing schemes and different sorts of neuronal uh, message passing structures. Um, one of the most familiar is if we make the assumption that these are Gaussian um, uh, distributions, then we get something that looks like a predictive coding scheme um, where we pass messages uh, from our data and from our prior expectations to um, computer prediction error. So here we're making predictions uh, and we're subtracting those predictions from our data, using that to calculate a prediction error, which can then be used to update our um, our posterior expectations, and that can be passed up a hierarchy of um, of neurons. And the idea here is that we've gone from having a generative model and the idea of message passing to something that that, that uh, behaves a bit like message passing in a biological brain where we have a series of neurons that are communicating small amounts of information just to their neighbors. So having said that, the key thing that we need for any of this to work is a generative model and we need to have some assumptions about the form of that model and how, how we can express it um, and what sorts of things we might want to express. So I'm going to start off with a very simple sort of generative model um, that just describes the evolution of some hidden state now s over time. So here, um, here we have a hidden Markov model where the hidden states at one time generate the hidden states the next time and at the next time, and at each time step they generate some observable outcome o. Uh, and here we have a being our likelihood distribution, we have a prior belief of it over our initial state d, and then we have a series of transition probabilities that let us go from one to the next to the next. Um, at the lower part here, what I'm showing is the, the message passing scheme that emerges from using this particular sort of generative model. And here you can see, again, we have an error expectation type uh, relationship. But now we also have messages being passed forwards and backwards uh, about beliefs about particular time points. So my beliefs about the present are informed by my beliefs about the past and also about the future. So I can predict and post it. Um, so this allows us to now say, if we imagine we're generating some data from, uh, from a series of states, we're generating some data shown by these blue dots, we can then look at if we were to perform this message passing, try and infer the causes of those blue dots, we can look at the sorts of inferences that might be made and the sort of neuronal firing we might expect. So just to unpack the graphic on the left a little bit, the red dots here, so the axis here is time, uh, and uh, each row here represents a different possible value the hidden state could take, so these are categorical distributions. And so we've got beliefs about each time point. The red dots here are showing the, uh, the real hidden state that we used in these simulations. And the blue dots are showing the data that those generated. And you can see we're presenting uh, one data point per time step. So it's gradually getting more and more information. The shading here represents the beliefs about uh, which hidden state is causing, uh, is causing those data at each time point. So we can think of this as if uh, they were the neural firing rates of these expectation neurons. And you can see that these are partially predicting uh, what it's expecting in the future based upon what it's seen. Uh, and it's also re-evaluating past beliefs based upon, uh, based upon new um, data. So here, the, the darker it is, the more probable it thinks that particular hidden state was. So again, each row represents an alternative hidden state. So this provides a very simple example of inference in a dynamical setting. Clearly, though, this isn't a good uh, description of how, um, how perception really works in the brain, um, because it's just too passive a process. 
And to give you an example to illustrate this, this is one of my favorite examples of how important action is in perception. This is an illusion known as, um, as Troxler fading. The idea is if you fixate on the center of the cross in this graphic on the left and just maintain fixation there, you should gradually see the colors around it fading away. Um, whereas when you start moving your eyes again, you can see those colors again immediately. And this is just a really nice example of the idea that, uh, that perception is an active, not a passive process, that actually how we move our eyes, how we actively engage with the world around us has a huge impact upon, um, upon the inferences that we end up making. Um, and so to account for that, we now need to extend our model and say, actually, there's not just one trajectory that we could be pursuing. There are a series of alternative trajectories or policies that affect these transition probabilities. So here we've now got pi, which is our policy, where we're going to move our eyes, um, that's affecting the hidden state of where my eyes are currently pointing, which is affecting our inferences about uh, the colors. To do that, we need to now adjust our message passing as well so that we can make inferences about that. And I think the, the key thing to note about this is just the symmetry between our generative model up at the top here uh, and the message passing that's performed to invert that. Because remember, each stage is effectively just undoing what was done to the data to generate it so that we can infer the causes. But now the causes include what I am doing and also what I'm going to do. So I'm just showing a simulation here once we've added that in, uh, where now the red dot represents where the eyes are moving. And you can see that the red dot on the right here is staying still. So this is a simulation of the inferences made when I fixate in one place. And you can see I'm gradually getting more uncertain about the, the, uh, the outside colors and they're fading away much as I'm sure they did when you stared at the uh, cross in the middle. Whereas that doesn't happen when I move my eyes around and can maintain that percept. So once we've said that action is important and we need to model how I'm actually going to engage with the world, um, we then need to think about how we're going to uh, set up a prior belief about that series of actions in our generative model. And I'm going to start by thinking about how you'd set down a prior belief about uh, achieving the goal, about reaching some sort of desired steady state. And we can do that relatively simply uh, using um, uh, using the idea that we've already spoken about, this tending towards some uh, steady state. Because we can think of a system that tends towards some steady state, we can think of it as if that steady state is its goal, it's the thing that it tends towards. It's sort of the tautology of what is a goal. A goal is just something that I behave to achieve. Um, so you can turn it around and say either I am behaving to achieve a goal, or the goal is defined in relation to the behavior. But if we just say a goal is the steady state we're, we're tending towards, we can now say, if we parameterize that steady state and say, let's say, probability of O given, given some parameters C, so this is probability of uh, this final state uh, under some desired distribution uh, given by C, we can measure how different uh, our distribution would look following a particular policy. And so now we just have a Kale divergence uh, which many of you will be familiar with already, that just quantifies how different those two distributions are. And effectively, a policy, a plan that leads us towards our goal will be one where this Kale divergence is as small as possible. Just to illustrate some recent work we've done looking at slightly more complex goals that aren't just a single Gaussian, we can actually couple together a whole series of different states and look at uh, evolving towards a particular uh, goal state here showing the a sort of individual instance here showing that averaged over lots of different um, uh, instantiations of the system and finally here showing it in terms of the density dynamics. Just by writing down this final goal state we can see the system evolving uh, towards it. Um, this is probably uh, familiar to most people but just to briefly go over the notion of a Kale divergence. If we imagine that we've got uh, two distributions here, parameterized by some mean and, um, and variance. Uh, we can measure how far we go from one distribution to another with this Kale divergence. So you can see when they're very close together, the Kale divergences are almost zero. But as they move further apart and become more different, you can see these large changes in the Kale divergence. Here we've got the Kale divergence from the blue to the red distribution and from the red to the blue. And the point to make here is just that the Kale divergence is not a symmetric measure. Um, 
except in, in sort of very small region around uh, around being zero. Um, this is less. This uh, lower right plot is less important for this talk, but is, is the idea that there are alternative symmetric measures we could be using, and this is a measure of the information length, so the path that we've moved through some uh, parameter space or through some distribution space of distributions. Um, but the key measure, the key message from this slide is just that we can use this KL divergence as a way of scoring how different our distribution of observations are under the policy we're currently pursuing versus uh, some desired distribution parameterized by C. Just to reinterpret this line, and this is just a rearrangement of exactly the same quantity, we can think of it in terms of a negative predictive entropy. So this is how dispersed do I think, um, do I think things will be under this policy? How uncertain am I about what I'd see if I, if I did this? Um, and here, uh, a measure of um, the average value of O, or the average value, sorry, of um, of this um, of the log probability under the desired distribution, given that we're following a particular policy. And this is useful intuitively because it says that uh, first of all, we should try and find the um, if we're trying to minimize this divergence, we're trying to maximize the probability. We're trying to stay in those regions of very high probability under this steady state. But then the entropy term sort of counteracts that a bit and says, actually, we shouldn't be too precise. We shouldn't be going for a point estimate. Actually, it's a matter of um, trying to uh, match the distribution and match the variance of it as well. So we're not just finding a point estimate uh, and trying to go towards a single goal state. We're actually trying to match a distribution. Um, if there were no, it's interesting to think about what would happen if there were no preferences, if this distribution were completely flat. In that scenario, we would just be maximizing this, uh, this entropy here. So this is basically saying I should seek out more uncertain states. I should seek out things that I don't know as much about. Um, and that results in a sort of simple form of uncertainty sampling or um, uh, in some scenarios, a, a simple primitive form of information seeking. Um, and that's important to remember, and we'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Um, so that would be one way of behaving if our aim were simply to reach a goal state. But we could also behave in such a way that we try and uh, maximize the amount of information we can get. An information gain um, we can express directly in terms of another Kale divergence. And here, this is the Kale divergence between a joint probability distribution between O and S and the marginal distributions of O and S uh, are, are observations and our hidden states under some policy. Um, so this is just a mutual information, as I'm sure many people will realize. Um, and it's effectively saying that the states that give me the most information or the policies that lead to the most information gain are those that lead to the states and observations having more mutual information about one another. And this sort of makes intuitive sense. It says that um, that observations that have a high degree of mutual information about uh, about the states that cause them, um, if I seek those observations out, um, that's the same as finding those observations that will best update my beliefs about states. And we can see this by rearranging this quantity in various different ways. So I've just got Bayes' theorem shown at the, at the bottom here. Uh, so if we use the first decomposition here, uh, in terms of a posterior probability, states given observations and the observations, uh, and we factorize this in that way, then uh, we can cancel out this P of O given pi uh, on this side and this side, and we end up with this quantity here, which is now the Kale divergence or the expected Kale divergence between my beliefs after making an observation and before making the observation. So it's how different is my posterior going to be from my prior? And this again is just an expression of information gain. It's saying the best policies that maximize my information gain are those that lead to a big update from what I believed before I observed uh, what I would see and afterwards. If we then use this other expression where we've now got our likelihood of O given S and our prior of S given, given uh, policy, uh, and we factorize this in that way, then we can cancel out the uh, P of S given pi term instead. And here we end up with um, the 
posterior predictive entropy we had again. So this is all the predictive entropy. So this is again saying how uncertain do I am I about the observations I would observe under that policy? How dispersed are they? And it's saying um, that the more dispersed they are, the less certain I am, the better. Um, and then this other term, which is now the entropy of this uh, likelihood term. So how related are the states to the observations that they generate? And this one I find quite intuitive when you think about in terms of experimental design, because there's no point designing any experiment or, or doing science when you already know what you're going to observe. So actually we want to choose experiments that, that, um, that we don't already know what we would see. We want to find out new things. So if I could predict the data I'd get by performing a particular experiment, then this entropy would be extremely low and there'd be no point performing that experiment. However, if we just did that, then we would end up uh, just pressing a random number generator over and over again, because uh, we never know which number we're going to get next. But we don't actually necessarily learn anything about the process generating those random numbers by doing so. And that's where this, uh, this um, conditional entropy comes into play. And the role of the conditional entropy is to say, um, if there's no relationship between the hypotheses, the states that are causing things, and the, the outcomes they generate, if it's just random, then that's not a good experiment either. There's no point using completely noisy measuring instruments um, that tell us nothing about what we're getting and we're just getting random noise. So here we're saying we should try and find the things we're most uncertain about, but only if we can actually resolve that uncertainty. So let's put that into practice and think about a generative model and what sort of behaviours we get. And we can do this quite simply by adding in a couple of new parameters. So here we're adding in a parameter that just says, how uncertain is my likelihood mapping? So this is just increasing or decreasing the entropy. So this is just an inverse temperature parameter. And what we're showing here is just, if I had a series of possible outcomes, given I were in a particular state, as this number increases, we get more and more confident about which outcome it is, whereas when it's zero, we have a flat distribution. So it's just a, a temperature or a precision parameter. And then we can do the same thing with our beliefs about uh, transitions over time. So how certain am I, if I were in this state at this particular time, how confident am I about the next state I would be in, and to what degree is this world much more volatile or random? Um, and we can manipulate these parameters so that we can effectively manipulate the different entropy terms I showed you in the previous slide. So here is a, an example of a simple visual foraging task and simulated sort of trace as I look at these different locations. Each location is associated with a different value of these, um, of these different temperature parameters. So in the upper plot, everything is equally precise. There, there's a similar noisiness to the likelihood mapping in every quadrant, and there's a similar um, randomness in the transition probabilities. And you can see that here, I basically sample all four quadrants uh, with um, relatively similar uh, frequency. In the middle plot, we've effectively turned down the precision in the lower left plot. So this is now saying that the likelihood is much more ambiguous. There's a much greater conditional entropy. Uh, so I'm now ignoring that. Uh, and you can see that that automatically happens because of the prior that I'm going to avoid ambiguous um, uh, states with a high conditional entropy. Um, sometimes in psychology, this is referred to as the streetlight effect, um, where the idea is that if I'm uh, coming home late at night and I've dropped my car keys, the first place I'll look for them is under the street light. And that's not because that's the place they're most likely to be, it's just that that's where I get the most precise information straight away. So effectively, what we've done in this, uh, in this simulation is to turn off the street lights in one location, and we observe that I tend to ignore that location and go for those that I can get more information more reliably and more quickly. Finally, in the lower left plot, effectively what we've done here is we've decreased the, uh, or we've made the transitions in the upper left quadrant more stochastic, more random. And the consequence of this is that every time I've looked at it, it may have changed since the last time I looked at it, which means that predictive uncertainty, how uncertain am I about what I'd see if I looked there, is always very high. Um, and so that drives me to keep looking back and keep rechecking that location. So finally, how do we put these things together? How do we relate to the exploitative and explorative aspects of, um, of behavior? 
And we can actually put them together into a single quantity by noting the overlap between the two quantities. So here we've got our information gain, uh, and here we've got our Kale divergence for uh, this exploitation. Um, and we note that they overlap in this predictive entropy term. So if we just add in the, uh, uh, you know, this goal distribution to our explorative, or add in this condition, or subtract this conditional entropy from our exploitative um, objective functions, we end up with this uh, function here, which is known as our expected free energy. Um, and then we can simply set our prior belief about the policies we're going to pursue uh, to be such that the um, the lower the expected free energy, the more it's minimized, the uh, more likely it is I'm going to pursue that policy. Um, just to rearrange this quantity um, a little bit, we can see the relationship between it and a free energy and therefore see why we can uh, associate the idea of an expected free energy and free energy and why the two are, are effectively called the same sort of thing, why they're both free energy quantities. We've got our probability of our outcomes here and then we've got our uh, difference between our um, distributions conditioned upon or not conditioned upon our observations. So um, the next thing I want to do is briefly talk about how decisions are implemented and in the interest of time I'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, but the idea is we've got to go from the decision we've made, where I'm going to look, to the movement that actually implements that decision. And so here we can use a very similar sort of generative model. But here, instead of saying the state at one time, the next and the next, here we're actually looking at temporal derivatives. So this would be like the position, the velocity and the acceleration, as if we're sort of taking a local Taylor series approximation to that location and we're just inferring the to that to a particular point in time. And we're, um, uh, we're just making inferences about the coefficients of that uh, Taylor series approximation to the trajectory. Um, and then we can sort of take the priors we have here and uh, use those to predict different sorts of movement. And we can infer based upon a generative model of the biophysics of it, how we will actually implement that movement. So here what I've done is I've mapped this sort of message passing for a particular model that looks at the biophysics of eye movements to the neuroanatomy of the ocular motor brainstem. And here we can now start to simulate those movements by selecting different priors that lead to things like saccadic eye movements or even smooth pursuit eye movements just by changing these priors. Finally, we can put together the, um, the continuous eye movement um, aspect of this um, with the discrete models we've generated so far, effectively by plugging in our beliefs about where I'm going to look that we've developed from our, um, uh, our sort of discrete time a hidden Markov model and partially observed Markov decision process type models. So once I've inferred which course of action I'm going to take, I can now plug that into this continuous model and use that to generate priors about how I'm going to move my eyes. So here what we're seeing is um, uh, beliefs about where I'm going to look at this time point, the next time point, and the time point after that, mapped into the continuous domain, and this is set up to look like the sort of neural dynamics you might see in the superior colliculus. Uh, eventually generating these eye movements by predicting uh, the sort of proprioceptive and visual data I might expect, given that I'm anticipating looking over there. I'll go through this very, very quickly, but we can actually look at different sorts of behaviours generated by changing different priors in the system. So here we've got a very simple sort of working memory task where I look in the centre, the target appears, I have to wait until there's a change in colour, uh, from red to blue, and then I make the saccade. Uh, and we can we can manipulate different parts of this model, which we've associated with different sorts of neurotransmitter to generate different sorts of behavior. And I'll just focus on this last one, which is changing the precision at the continuous level. And we can sort of see the influence on behavior and the slowing of this, uh, this movement. Um, the idea being that this is very close to the idea of, or, or the sort of slowed eye movements you might associate with um, uh, excessive gabergic drive in the brainstem, the sort of thing you might associate with excessive benzodiazepine use and slowing of eye movements that's observed there. Now interpreted in terms of a parameter of a, a generative model predicting proprioceptive data. Finally, and I think I'm running out of time, so I'll try and do this relatively quickly, uh, we can start to set up much more hierarchical models that look at how these things evolve over different times. 
And that gives us one more opportunity to put priors into the, into the game by putting in empirical priors that connect what's happening at one level of the model uh, and use that as a prior for what's having, happening at another level. So we're now not just trying to explore and exploit, but we're also trying to do things consistent with how I typically behave in this sort of scenario. It's much more habitual, um, but also in, 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 so it's a much more habitual way of driving this and um, depends upon a separation of these different timescales. So the task we're going to look at here, there are basically three targets in space and I've got to move my arm between these different targets uh, and try and reach those. So the top level the targets can change at various different time points. And I'll show you an animation of this to make it a bit clearer in a moment. But they change more slowly than the change I can make with my arm. So I have to be able to move my arm to the, the target. Um, and only after I've done that should the target then change to the next one. Uh, and then at the lowest level, we have the, the even faster sort of continuous trajectory of the arm movement itself. So we, we basically have a model of the targets that's changing slowly, a model of uh, the decisions I'm making as to where to move my arm, and then a model of the arm movements themselves going at slow, medium, and fast timescales. And here, again, we've got the message passing that solves this problem. Mapping that onto the anatomy of the uh, motor system, which is known quite well, we can then simulate the sort of movements we might expect and actually perform almost a synthetic neurological exam on it. So here we're looking at a tendon tap type re reflex. Where here I'm just tapping on the biceps tendon and seeing the reflexive movement of the arm. We can perform various lesions and check the consistency with what we might expect in biology. So here we have an exaggerated tendon reflex with a corticospinal tract uh, disconnection uh, or um, lesion, an oscillatory reflex of the sort we might expect with a cerebellar lesion. And then we can go to our task where we're moving between the different targets and use this as a way of testing coordination. So here you can see the task being performed well, where it's inferring which course of action it needs to pursue to get to the different targets. But we can then induce various lesions in this and get sort of hypermetria and the taxic arm movements we might associate with a cerebellar lesion. Uh, we can uh, make changes at even higher levels of the model and look at what happens when there are frontal lesions that lead to a failure to adjust quickly after a change in contingencies. Uh, and here you can see it can perform it, the movements are unimpaired, um, but there's a, a slight delay in adjusting to changes in context. And we can even look at sort of basal ganglia lesions and the hypokinetic type um, disorders you might expect in something like Parkinson's disease. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and say we started from the idea of what's the scope of active inference. It's the idea of maintaining this steady state over time. We looked at that in terms of maximization of some probability distribution, which can be interpreted as a model evidence and be used to develop message passing schemes with some degree of neuronal plausibility. We looked at the mapping of that onto various neural systems, particularly focusing on things like eye movements and exploration and exploitation, and finally focused on the idea of looking at um, hierarchical multi-timescale um, uh, movement planning and the behavior that results from these different sorts of priors, and the conceptualization of neurological disease as changes in, in these prior beliefs due to patho uh, pathological uh, insults. So with that, I'd just like to say thanks to a lot of people who've, who've contributed to various aspects of this work, uh, and thank you everybody for listening. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas. I'll do the applause since we can't hear everybody else. <laughs> okay, so that's, uh, we've got a good amount of time for, for questions and answers. Uh, we've only got one question here at the moment, so that makes it fairly easy to, to make the selection. Um, we've got some applause coming through on the comments, which is good. Um, what I might do, I, I might read this question out. The, uh, the, the person who asked if I just in hasn't indicated whether they want to come on screen or not, so I might read it out in case it's not shown on the recording. Uh, so Thomas, you mentioned goal states as predictable states. Can this be extrapolated as any reward being the most predictable external state, resulting in a predictable change of internal state? And if so, is this due to the ease to getting to the mean or mode of the states or how reduced the variance uncertainty is in getting to that state? Thomas, you can see, see this text in front of you, can't you, as well? Uh, let me see. Um, if you click on ask a question down, you, uh, down the bottom, there's an ask a question link. You can click on that. Ah, yes, I see. Yeah. 
Okay, um, so it's a, it's a good question and there are several different parts to that. Um, so the idea of goal states as being something predictable is, is in a sense just a tautology. It's just saying that when we're trying to describe a system as if it's behaving according to a goal, effectively what we're saying is that that system uh, tends towards that goal. It just behaves in such a way that that's where it, where it ends up. So it's more a description of how something behaves in the sort of data they seek out. Um, so the idea of can you think of it as being a, a reward in the most predictable state, uh, I suppose most predictable sensory state perhaps, uh, it's the idea of um, the, the most rewarding, the, the best state to seek out is the one that is the most probable under that steady state distribution. The, where it comes into the most predictable change of internal state, I suppose that comes from thinking about the information gain. So now we've moved out of the realm of, of goals in the sense of rewards. We're now moving to the idea of um, behaving to maximize our information. And that, yes, that will change our brain state as, as much as possible if we've got information that will, um, uh, that will change our beliefs as much as possible. In terms of the question of mean or mode of states and the variance, so when you think of it in terms of minimizing KL divergence, we're trying to map, we're trying to map both the first and second order statistics and any, any subsequent statistics as well. So it, it isn't just the um, it isn't just maximizing mode. It can also be looking at getting the variance to be similar as well. I brought uh, Fart on, on screen actually. Uh, did you want to uh, ask any clarifications to that? Oh, yeah. that, uh, was that all okay? Yeah, um, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, goals are in that sense, the new definition is something that's very internal rather than something on the external, something that's most predictable for the internal state to change and not something that's you know really very specific to the external environment. So extrapolating it further, can, can we say that a value, the, how we assign value to something is how predictable was it to predict kind of second order derivative of that across different interactions of something. I mean, I suppose I suppose value in a, a traditional sense would be related to how predictable something is under the under the desired or goal distribution. Yeah. Uh, it, but from an active inference perspective, we're also interested in maximizing information. Um, sorry, there's a bit of feedback coming through as well. I think it might be on my end. Yeah, I'll just um, mute, uh, mute Fad for the moment. Uh, Fadi, I think you can unmute yourself if you need to add something. Um, but, but under active inference, uh, or even under even under a, a kale control system, actually, the more predictable something is under your generative model, the less good it is as a as a as a goal, in the sense that um, that uh, posterior predictive entropy will be very small. So it's actually better to seek out, in the absence of some uh, highly probable state under our goal distribution. Um, uh, we're actually much better off finding things that are as unpredictable as possible. As long as that sort of uncertainty yeah, is yeah. predictable states. I understand, I agree perfectly, but there are instances when we feel bored, right? When something is too predictable, we get bored, but at the same time, we want some predictability in achieving that end result as well. There's a dichotomy. Sure, no. And that, and that comes down to a sort of old-fashioned balance between exploration and exploitation, um, and that that sort of naturally accommodated using using an expected free energy, um, because you, you you're sort of balancing um, you're balancing trying to find things that are as unpredictable and as novel as possible and that change our beliefs as much as possible, which is the drive to avoid boredom, as you put it, um, along against the idea of finding things that. Um, uh, that um, that are consistent with our, our sort of goals, you know, maintaining our homeostasis, um, ensuring we're well fed and those kinds of things. So it's, it's a balance between the two, but it, if, you, if you use an information gain type measure to do this, then it naturally plays off against each other because as you resolve more information, the potential to gain information decreases. And so you end up behaving more consistently to, towards getting your goal state. Uh, Whereas at the start of exposure to a new environment, actually you're going to spend much more time exploring, seeking out the novel, uh, trying to trying to um, avoid boredom. And part of trying to avoid boredom isn't just finding things that are unpredictable, but finding things that 
um, because a random number generator is not a, it, you know, you get quite bored pressing that all day. It's finding things that actually change your beliefs. Thanks. Okay, I'll take the bar off now. Uh, we've got about a minute left. Uh, there's one more question here um, from uh, from Sarah Martin. Uh, it, it's possible that this has been addressed uh, in your last answer, but let's let's take a look at it anyway. Uh, so Sarah said, and I'll, I'll invite Sarah on screen, but you don't have to accept it, Sarah, if you'd rather me just uh, just read it. It says, in my personal experience, when I've tried to make systems that manipulate their environment to maximise the predictive ability of trajectories, I get limit cycles, which seem undesirable. First, are they desirable? If not, what part of your theory allows you to avoid limit cycles in your simulations? Did you want to clarify anything, Sarah, on that before, uh, before Thomas takes it? Uh, just that I may have misunderstood something. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm curious. Um, I mean, it's, a diff it's always difficult to answer a question of whether something's desirable. Uh, it depends what you know what, what you're desiring. If you're desiring an environment with a uh, predictable trajectory, if that's your key aim, then I suppose the limit cycle is actually quite a good uh, good thing to end up with because you end up with that consistency. Um, it may be undesirable though in an environment where there's still uncertainty to resolve and where I want to learn more about it. It may be undesirable if that limit cycle exists in a region of space that's inconsistent with my homeostasis or with um, you know, the sort of steady state of, of, that's consistent with my continued existence as a system. Um, so really it's a difficult one to answer because there are certain sorts of systems whose um, whose steady state is consistent with the limit cycle and they are the sort of system who behaves according to a, a limit cycle but there are other sorts of systems with whom that would not be uh, consistent with the kind of system they are um, so in terms of desirability i i, th I think it, it's very subjective just a uh, on that um oh my God, i already forgot what i was going to say uh oh yeah so I feel like limit cycles do allow you to explore the environment quite well because you can imagine a limit cycle that visits every single state and then goes back to the original. So yes. maybe they're maybe they're more desirable than I think. Well, yes, and I suppose from an explorative point of view, you could imagine in the simulations I was showing where I was looking between the different quadrants, it may be that a limit cycle is completely optimal in that sort of scenario because as soon as I've looked away from one place, there's a bit of uncertainty accumulated. As soon as I've looked at the next place, there's uncertainty accumulated about the previous ones. And so whichever one I haven't looked at for the longest has the most uncertainty that's accumulated over time. So it, it, that, that would prompt exactly a limit cycle type behavior, which would be perfectly optimal in that, in that scenario. Um, okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, all right, I'm going to take Sarah off now, and while I'm inviting uh, Abed uh, Maka up, let me just uh, grab him. Uh, let's uh, let's thank Thomas again. Well, I, again, I'll applaud on behalf of everybody else. And while I do, let me apologise for a very poor introduction <laughs> when I threw to you in the first place. I think I, I looked at the time and realised how far over time I'd, I'd given my little introduction for, and I was a bit flustered. But uh, let me no, apologise for that. Thomas Parr from UCL, and thank you for a great start to the workshop.